I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and we have a very interesting discussion for you today on Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's legacy. As many of you know, he was the longest serving prime minister in Japan, and I think it's a good time now with his recent passing to reflect on, on his legacy. And so here to lead the discussion today, we have our, um, our um, East Asia Program Director, Jacques Delisle, whom many of you already know, uh, but he is certainly an appropriate person to lead this discussion. He's the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. His most recent book, To Get Rich is Glorious, Challenges Facing China's Economic Reform and Opening at 40, uh, was co-edited with Avery Goldstein. His next book, Taiwan Under Tsai, is co-edited with June Teufel Dreyer, who is familiar to many of our, many in our audience, I'm sure. That's forthcoming, um, I guess, later this year or early next. Yeah, every, uh, every author I know, their book's been the timing is a little messed up. So soon, it's coming soon. Um, uh, he received his JD and graduate education in political science at Harvard. He's also a member of the National Committee on US-China Relations, vice chair of the Pacific Rim section of the American Society of International Law. Before I turn over the reins to Jacques, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. And I encourage you as we go along to start putting questions in that Q&A uh, section. And um, we will draw on those and, and at some point in the discussion. Um, also, I would like to, while I've got you, also say thank you. Thank you for your support of FPRI. Uh, we can't do these programs without you. So please, if you're not a member yet, consider joining me. And if you are a member, a partner, a sponsor, a board member, a special thank you to you for everything you do for us. Uh, we're deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Jacques. Well, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I can't imagine a better pair of people to have discussed the issue of Abe's foreign policy legacy than the two people we have with us today. I'll introduce them in the order in which they appear on my Zoom screen. Uh, <laughs> Sheila Smith is a senior fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she's the author of many works uh, concerning Japan's foreign relations, including the books Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power, Intimate Rivals, Japanese Domestic Politics and a Rising China, is also published in Japanese, and Japan's New Politics and the U.S.-Japan Alliance. Uh, you can see her work on the Council on Foreign Relations blog, Asia Unbound. Uh, she was at the East-West Center before moving uh, to the Council. Uh, she's also teaching at, I believe, Georgetown. Is that right now? Teaching there part-time, yes. And uh, was, has uh, been a visitor at many prestigious institutions in Japan, including uh, Keio University, including the Japan Institute for International Affairs, uh, Japan Institute of International Affairs, actually FPRI used to do some programming with them, and the Research Institute for Peace and Security, University of Tokyo, and others. She's chair of the Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission uh, and the U.S.-Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange, where she's an advisor, uh, and many other things as well. I won't burn through too much more of our time doing her, her introduction, except to say uh, that she's also an old friend of FPRI, having participated in several of our programs and having a piece in Orbis on the East uh, China Sea, Japan uh, set of, of issues a few years back when that issue heated up again. Uh, our second panelist, uh, Thomas Berger, is a professor of international relations at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. He's been at BU for a couple of decades now after having taught at Johns Hopkins before that. Uh, he too is the author of, of many works related to uh, Japan and its foreign policy, including War, Guilt, and World Politics after World War II, Cultures of Anti-Militarism, National Security in Germany and Japan, and he's the co-editor of Japan and International Politics, The Foreign Policies of an Adaptive State. He's also published widely uh, in foreign affairs and uh, political science journals, including International Security, uh, World Affairs Quarterly, and so on. Uh, he also has uh, written for Orbis, uh, doing a piece, and I think our soft power uh, special issue quite some, uh, some time back. So we're delighted to have you back with us. And I will also mention they were both Abe fellows. <laughs> so appropriately enough uh, that we will we'll turn to the question of Shinzo Abe and his uh, legacy in foreign policy. And of course, inevitably, that will take us into some domestic politics questions. <laughs> 
as well. But as Raleigh mentioned, Abe has been Japan's longest serving prime minister. Uh, Japan goes through prime ministers pretty quickly, but Abe was long serving by almost anybody's uh, standards, uh, having held the position briefly back in 2006, 2007, and now just uh, ending an eight year run. And it's been a pretty, uh, pretty dynamic and pretty interesting period. So a lot to talk about here. I guess I will start with the piece that is probably of most immediate interest to our audience, which is the Japan-US relationship. Uh, and in an era where the current US president has not had the best of relations with many ally allies, uh, Japan and Abe stand out as something of an exception. Abe seems to have managed relations with Trump uh, reasonably well. Uh, so let me for turn first to Sheila and then to Tomas to address those, those issues. Thank you, Jacques, and I thank you, FPRI, for having me back. I'm delighted to be part of the conversation with my friend and colleague, Tom Berger. Um, you know, the, the U.S. relationship, of course, is, Japan, is the foundation of Japanese post-war diplomacy. Our bilateral security treaty provides for U.S. strategic protection and also for the ability of the United States to forward deploy its forces in uh, East Asia. So it's a very critical part of the bilateral, the very critical part of Japan's diplomacy, but also in a very important part of our strategic outreach in the, in the Asia Pacific. I think the, the, the key to understanding how well Abe or Japan did in the era of Mr. Trump uh, is the personal dynamic that developed between the two of them. And I know we make a lot of personal relationships at the top, but I think in this case, it was an interesting dynamic. It was not the normal diplomatically created sense that the two leaders got along. Uh, Abe took a tremendous political risk at the end of 2016 when Mr. Trump was elected. Prior to becoming president, he went to visit him in Trump Tower, as we all know. There was a Golden Golf Club that was exchanged, and so there's lots of storytelling about that moment. But what really was going on over the first two years of the, of the relationship under President Trump was Abe trying to educate, encourage, uh, advocate for American interests in the Asia Pacific and why the U.S.-Japan alliance was so important to US interests. And so you saw him do that on trade. He did it obviously on the security side. Um, but it was an interesting relationship to watch develop. I sit in Washington DC. So for us, we watched, you know, Abe's visit in early on in the Trump uh, period, but then subsequent meetings leading up to the state visit by President Trump more recently to Japan uh, to meet with the new emperor and empress. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance but there was a lot of confirmation of basic Japanese interests in the alliance as well. So Abe did the, poli the political side of bonding with this new idiosyncratic and unpredictable president, but he also was a very steady and steadfast advocate of Japanese interests in the relationship as well. Well, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with Sheila with everything she said. I'm just trying to find ways of supplementing what she uh, already commented on. Um, with regard to the personal relationship and in general, the Abe skill at um, managing the tra challenges of um, tra Donald Trump's transactional approach to uh, foreign policy, it's interesting to contrast this with other US allies. And I work a lot on Europe as well. And uh, Germany in particular, you, you might say, would be the European counterpoint. And uh, unlike Germany, um, uh, Abe's relationship with Trump was excellent. I mean, he really, now some people sort of said that he was overly solicitous of uh, Donald Trump. There were tensions and there are issues which are still going to come up. Um, Trump pushed very hard on the burden sharing issue and the Japanese managed to avoid that issue. There was a great deal of fear about trade and um, uh, how uh, sharp that would be. But again, with considerable skill and patience, the Japanese uh, government under Abe managed to avoid these issues. Europe, on the other hand, and Angela Merkel, the relationship couldn't be worse. And the contrast is really quite stark. Now, there are different reasons for why that should be. The Europeans are also trying to um, establish a little bit more of an independent foreign policy stance. And we should expect more of that. But the Japanese, instead of sort of decided to double down on the US uh, security relationship. And that's the other thing which I would sort of emphasize. I'm sure we're going to get to that. Um, the US Japanese alliance has long been an asymmetrical alliance. It's deep, <coughs> it's strong, it's got uh, endurance, um, and, it can, and it's going to continue to be important. But there's always been a sort of asymmetry, uh, a lack of balance in terms of what the two sides promised to do e for each other. The United States always promised uh, in some way to come to Japan's aid if it were it or territories under its jurisdiction came under attack. Uh, Japan had no similar obligation. 
um, I think under Abe, um, we have seen considerable movement towards making this a more balanced relationship. And I think the 2014 reinterpretation of the Japanese constitution, which allows for the first time Japan to openly say that it's involved in the collective defense activity, um, at the implementation thereafter in 2015 of the, the security law package, which uh, Abe had to face, uh, and he was surprised by this. He was surprised at the depth of resistance that he found. He had to come, overcome quite a few obstacles, but he managed to push that through. Now, this is still not a symmetrical relationship by any means, but uh, these are big steps for Japan. And uh, if we ever have a military type of contingency in the East Asian region, uh, it sets the groundwork for a much more effective um, cooperation between the US and Japan. That's terrific. So I want to uh, uh, pick up on a couple of, of threads there. So you've, you've both spoken quite eloquently to the US-Japan bilateral relationship and how Abe uh, negotiated that in a somewhat difficult time. Uh, but of course, that exists in the context of broader US policy toward Asia. Uh, and so I wonder if you'd be willing to comment either on the, or both uh, on the ways in which uh, the Trump policy toward other countries in Asia, uh, relations with other uh, allies and, and sometimes possible adversaries in Asia, uh, complicated Abe's foreign policy dealings. <coughs> and where uh, Abe's foreign policy agenda fits into the free and open Indo-Pacific policy, which of course is a centerpiece of Trump era post Obama pivot uh, US policy toward the region where in some sense uh, the Indo-Pacific concept goes back to Abe initially a strategy then being downgraded to a vision. I think that's a downgrade, but perhaps you could speak to that. Uh, so let me throw it first to Sheila and then to talk. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we, we make a lot of the Abe Trump relationship and how effectively and I think Tom and I agree that Abe was Abe and his government and the cabinet were very effective in trying to navigate this difficult moment in US foreign policy. But I think there's also a case to be made about Abe's legacy about how he navigated around the United States and around President Trump and I think you see it obviously in the trade area. And this is, you know, uh, the CPTPP, as we now call it today, comprehensive and progressive, thanks to uh, Canadian Prime Minister uh, Trudeau. Um, but the Trans-Pacific Partnership was something the American government led, the Obama administration, but even before that, Bush, the Bush administration, wanted to weave this new high standards trade agreement across the Pacific, including Latin American countries and Asia Pacific countries. And um, we got just about there, and then we had our election. And of course, one of the things that President Trump did within his first 100 days was withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that was a big blow, I think, to Tokyo. It was certainly a big blow to the Abe cabinet, who had, you know, Abe, when he became prime minister again in 2012, uh, um, began the process of building the political foundations for Japan to participate in that regional trade agreement. So Abe had a lot at stake. Um, Japan had a lot at stake. But when Trump said no, uh, he wanted a bilateral agreement with, with Japan, and then Abe moved with Australia and other partners to go on ahead without the United States. And I think that's, a, that's one of the markers, I would say, that it's not just how Abe managed Washington, but how he navigated around uh, the United States. I think that's really important, and you see that again in, in the Japan-EU trade agreement. Um, the other piece, as you mentioned, Jacques, was the, the, freedom, the free and open Indo-Pacific. And again, this is one of the areas where I see it as a kind of a cumulative Japanese aggregation of a regional strategy um, that Abe could articulate very, very well in this Indo-Pacific. I don't think strategy and vision is a, is a bad or a significant shift. I think what Abe was trying to do there was to accommodate the different definitions of what a free and open Indo-Pacific would look like to Australia, to India, and obviously to the United States as well. So he, he peddled a little bit of the softer image. Right? Uh, this is not containing China, in other words. It's a vision for the entire region that that, that Japan and Abe continue to, to advocate for being inclusive, right, with China. And you see that in his outreach to Xi as well. So second order is Abe, you know, and his government did a very good job of bringing all the instruments of statecraft that Japan could bring to bear, including its military, which we could talk more about later, but uh, its economic, its commercial interests, its diplomatic interests, its support for a free and open democracies, and its military uh, capabilities, which are already growing, as Tom pointed out. So I think that's the second place where Abe worked really hard to get the Trump administration to, to bring its a heft to the region in a way where um, it would, you know, basically demonstrate American power, but also American sustainability. 
Yeah. Well, again, I mean, I don't want to parrot, you know, we're, we're having too much of a love fest, so she and I will find <laughs> something to fight about. We'll find a place to disagree somewhere. Yeah, we'll find places. <laughs> I, and I think there, there are quite a few things that one could add. Um, I think one of the things, the big issues which we're going to be talking about is, of course, the sort of growing tension between the United States and China. Um, we are not quite at a Cold War situation, but it's getting kind, Cold War-y kind of uh, atmosphere in the East Asian region. And Japan, which for a long time during the real Cold, the old Cold War, the, the ye old goody Cold War of uh, the US-Soviet uh, spread strike, Japan had the luxury of not being on the front lines. Right, I mean, a little bit because of the Northern Territories, but Japan had a certain degree of insulation um, from that situation. Japan today is on the front line. <laughs> in a way it wasn't during the old Cold War. Moreover, to make things worse, Japan's economy, like that of many economies around the world, and especially in Asia, um, is heavily invested in the Chinese economy in a way that uh, was not true during the Soviet era, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia or the Soviet Union. So uh, Japan finds itself now in a much more difficult strategic environment than it used to. And uh, Abe, whose instincts, and along with that of other Japanese uh, conservatives, um, are sort of reflexively, I don't want to say anti-Chinese, but very, very suspicious of China. Um, and there are people who really want to take it, and Sheila's written a book on this topic, and so she can speak uh, very authoritatively about this, but I've been looking at this topic also for some 30 years, so I can say a few things. And Abe, I think to his credit, after he came into office the second time in 2012, and what really made that uh, move possible, I mean, his, many people would have counted him out in terms of his political future. Um, Abe can thank Xi Jinping for having a second chance and for becoming Japan's second longest serving prime minister because it was the fight over the Senkaku Jiaoyu Islands, the disputed islands of the East China Seas, which uh, created the political opportunity for somebody, a hardliner, somebody with the credentials that Abe had to come back into power. And so for the first few years, we had a very tough and tense situation between Japan and China. And it's not over yet. In fact, I think those tensions are much, are going to continue. But Abe, to his credit, saw the opportunity to break through in 2015. And again, recently, we had an unusual situation taking advantage of China's problems economically and geostrategically, increasingly isolated China. He reached out to China in ways that I think are going to help stabilize the relationship. It, this is a tactical move on his part, but a very astute move, and one which I think reflects in a, a, a good understanding of the strategic situation. Now, going beyond the Sino-Japanese rela Sino relationship, so broader issue of the Indo-Pacific, the free and open Indo-Pacific, um, for those of us who've studied Japanese foreign policy for a long time, Japan never used to be a big advocate of democratization and human rights. That doesn't mean that they don't value it, they just didn't believe in preaching it uh, to other countries. Um, look at their policy towards Myanmar, Burma, for example. Um, but they have used this as a mechanism for reaching out and also legitimating both internally and ex both externally, but also internally. How do you get the Japanese people? This is the big, again, the other big problem that the Japanese and Abe face. Is that the Japanese people really want to focus on things like social security. Um, they want to focus on domestic political issues of one sort or another. We can, I'm sure we'll bring this up again when we talk about uh, the new Japanese Prime Minister Suga. But, um, how do you legitimate to them taking, out a, taking on a larger role? And I think in some ways putting it in the framework of democracy, uh, respect for the rule of law, common values, um, is the way to move that, the population forward, the Japanese public to accept taking on this larger security role. And that is probably going to be a lasting legacy. Legacy that I think owes a lot to Abe, but also owes a lot to the People's Republic of China, which uh, by picking fights with lots of its neighbors and clamping down on dissent inside of China, most importantly and most recently in Hong Kong, has really given um, impetus to otherwise what would be an uphill struggle. So, um, just to pick up on the, the, the China thread there, I mean, it was striking in the early years of Abe's second uh, premiership. China-Japan relations were you know, pretty terrible, right? We, we, it, it, it came out of the Diaoyu Senkaku 
Sen Kaku Dialyus, and I'm talking to Japan specialists. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, controversy over the so-called nationalization of the land, the uh, uh, dispatch by China of the fishing boats in front, uh, Coast Guard behind, Navy behind, for really unsettling what had been a status quo of, of pretty clear Japanese control over the area that all eroded. Uh, and Thomas, you just said that, that it was sort of a tactical move back. Um, is it a stable one? Is this one where Abe's successor is going to be able to, or be inclined to, or have uh, to keep not, relations on the upward trajectory? That's not up to Tokyo by itself. I mean, it'll be stable as long as the Chinese are going to be willing to make it stable. So I could turn the table here and turn you, the, the interlocutor, into the, into the speaker here. My impression is, and I think that is also the impression of lots of the folks in Tokyo, that this is not going to last that there are going to be ups and downs, and we don't know how far down the downs are going to get. Um, but while the going is good, you should give this a chance, you know, and um, uh, not needlessly get into a fight with China. The, the provocations in the East China Seas around the Senkaku, I say Senkaku Jiaoyu, Japan is at the heart of a number of the territorial disputes. I'm trying to write a book about it. Uh, when I talk, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law, as you as a lawyer know. And so I give presence. When I talk about Dokdo Takashima, that is the disputed islands between, or rocks between Japan and South Korea, since the Koreans are in possession of it, I say Dokdo Takashima. When I talk about the Northern Territories, I talk about the Kuril nor Northern Territories. Senkaku happens to be under Japanese control. So just you know, station identification, I think some of your audience are going to be sensitive to it. I say Senkaku uh, Diaoyu first. Now, uh, those are going on. And uh, in some ways, they are intensifying. And what makes matters worse, if you talk to former you know, retired or active duty Japanese military people, the Chinese capability to do things in the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands is improving. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, tense area, and I think that a lot of people in Japan are expecting sooner or later we're going to start seeing incidents like the sort that we see in the South China Seas. Uh, that is, uh, we are going to see collisions of boats, um, Chinese interference with fishing, um, uh, those kinds of things, and they're thinking about how to react. So I, I, I suspect that there's going to be a lot more, pardon the nautical metaphor, which is appropriate here, but a little bit cheesy, a lot of choppy waters. But I think in terms of, of trying to do this both in a way that the Japanese people can follow and also to convince the Americans and other key allies that Japan is not getting ahead of itself and creating problems, raising to use IR language, fears of entanglement, that the Japanese are going to drag us into a fight in which we have no interest. It's important for Japan to have a, a, this kind of, um, how should we say, uh, generous and pragmatic approach, as opposed to a nationalist and confrontational one. Sheila, Sheila do you want to weigh on these issues? Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> I'm trying to figure. <laughs> I out. figured as much. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure. So, I, I let me try to reposition the lens just slightly to what not only Abe but any Japanese prime minister will have to deal with at home. Right. I think Tom is absolutely correct that half of the bar, half of the stage is being set here by China and Chinese behavior is actually, to, especially this year, is making it particularly hard for Tokyo to move forward in the direction that Tokyo would like to go. And that's the pathway that Abe and his, his cabinet had, had laid out. She was coming for a state visit before it got derailed by COVID. But then the Hong Kong security law and position has complicated things, especially inside the, the Liberal Democratic Party. There's a real division now, I think, inside the party about whether sh she should be asked to come. It was postponed, and, and now some people think it should be, res the, <coughs> be rescinded. So you've got some dissension inside Abe's own party or Suga's own party, the new prime minister's party. But I think what's important to recognize here is just like the United States, right? Japan is deeply economically interdependent on its relationship with China. And what I wrote in my book, Intimate Rivals, um, was 20, published in 2015, so a little bit of ago, right? Was that economic interdependence was an objective of the post-war, post-normalization Japanese governments. And again, for your, reader, for your listeners who are not specialists on the relationship, that was done in you know, 1978 was when the normalization treaty was concluded. But the Japanese government really felt and successive prime ministers and business elites, and the, there was a large consensus in Japan that economic interdependence would help facilitate reconciliation. 
It would help overcome the residual war memory issues, which Tom has written about extensively. It would be a strategy that both Chinese and Japanese leaders could get, get around and focus on to try to bring their citizens in the two countries back into a much more, um, uh, you know, more predictable relationship right after the the end of world war ii um it was delayed of course by the cold war but what i think you you have to think about when you're thinking about both abe's legacy and what mr suga and whoever may succeed him has to think about is that the japanese public for a couple of decades now and this is part of what i wrote about you know five years ago has been really skeptical about the chinese leadership very specifically about the ccp uh, and its ambitions in the region, its attitudes towards Japan, its emphasis on the history issue and a kind of revisionist focus on the Japanese. Um, so you find you have a, a domestic population, a domestic public opinion in Japan that's highly skeptical. It's not just the right. You have a broad swath of centrist opinion in, in there as well. The second is the Senkaku issue has really ignited uh, folks on the right, the more nationalistic right, who normally did not have that big of a voice in the Japan-China relationship. Uh, it's, ter it's Japanese territory, they need to defend it, the Chinese are going to come take it, right? That, that ignites uh, a considerable swath of, of, of conservative opinion in Japan. And even, you know, all of us have our, our groups of friends who are non-political scientists that we, we talk to about these issues. And I am surprised with the depth by which the Senkaku issue and Chinese views on the, and behavior towards Japan on the Senkakus has, has really offended public sensitivities in Japan. Um, so you've got that. You've got then the real military consequences of Chinese, the aggregation and the, the deployment of Chinese military power. And this is the first island chain. You know, we all talk about the first island chain, which is of course Japan <laughs> and the Philippines on down, right? Uh, you, the Chinese are operating in, mar in maritime and air spaces that they were not operating a decade ago. And they're operating with much, much greater frequency and higher quality of capability. And they're demonstrably, they have a doctrine that says we want to push the United States out of the first island chain. We want to push the United States specifically, but others back away from Chinese territorial waters and airspace. So you've got a uh, basically over the decade, you've got intensification of Japanese negativity in the public sphere. You've got increased military capability by China and pushing at Japan's defenses, at the self-defense forces ability to defend Japanese waters and airspace. And then the final point, which Tom raised and you raised as well, which is how the US and China are, are, are getting along or not getting along these days. And I think this for the Japanese um, confounds a little bit of autonomy in the Japan-China relationship, let me put it that way. This is not the first time in the 1970s, of course, when Nixon opened to China, the Japan Japanese leaders were taken by surprise. They are concerned about the United States either getting too aggressive with China, right? too much of a sort of Cold War-like atmosphere, as Tom pointed out. Um, but they're also worried that Japan is not gonna be there enough, right? <laughs> to be able to defend the Senkakus or defend Japan should China get more adventurous. So you're watching Tokyo try to recalibrate how it manages not only the direct diplomacy with China, but also to make sure the United States has its back, so to speak, in whatever, relation, whatever formulation the Japan-China relationship has going forward. I'm afraid I share uh, your joint pessimism about uh, the Chinese side of, of that equation. I mean, all the needles are kind of pointing in the wrong direction. You have a, an inexorable power shift toward China. It invests heavily in its military, particularly its Navy and its force projection capabilities. You have the US-China relationship slipping into an ideational zone. We're really talking rival sy systems in a way that has a bit of a Cold War vibe to it. Uh, you've got nationalism taking an ever larger role as a sort of political centerpiece uh, for the regime in China, and that is especially tied to the neuralgic issues of, of so-called lost territory, uh, the unreclaimed, uh, unclaimed sovereign areas as China sees it in the East and South China Seas and Taiwan too, for that matter, Hong Kong, obviously kind of in that box too. Uh, so it, it's, all, it's all going not in a great direction. And when you compound that with doubts about the US commitment, uh, the reliability of U.S. commitments, uh, which are, I think, less of a concern for Japan, perhaps, than other states in the region, but, but certainly a concern there as well. Uh, so on a happy note, let me just say one thing before I throw out the next question to you, which is for our audience, uh, the Q&A function is open. Please uh, submit questions there. We'll be turning to those, to those shortly. 
Um, so there are two other relations uh, along relationships along Japan's periphery we haven't talked much about yet that have been somewhat less uh, happy, perhaps. Uh, you talked about the Northern Territories of relations with Russia, where there was an attempt to make some progress on that, but I think fair to say Abe did not uh, make a whole lot of uh, headway. Uh, and the other is South Korea, a, a perpetually fraught relationship which has not exactly headed in a great direction in the last several years. Uh, so Tom, do you want to start with this? Boy. <laughs> well, look, I'm at the, the Northern Territories, yeah, or the Southern Curled Northern Territories, I'll follow my own rule, is an issue of long standing. Um, it's been a long, deep uh, issue. The Japanese and the Russians or the Soviet Union came close to some kind of agreement back in 1956 already. And they're still talking about that as a formula. And that formula would have been a division, a, a, a kind of split, some kind of division of those islands. And there's some fluidity over that. Um, the problem is that uh, conservatives in Japan, there are a number of problems, first of all, I mean, both, both on the Russian side, you know, what do they want really in return? Um, and on the Japanese side, um, uh, what do they want? And uh, in some ways, the, Jap the, uh, the nationalist position, which Abe is sensitive to, um, is, well, we'll take two now and we want the other two later, <laughs> implicitly. And the Russians aren't willing to go for that. And in addition to that, we've got the problem that the U.S.-Russian relationship is not great. Um, Russian behavior, uh, and there's kind of a mirror image. I mean, the Russians want to use these issues to get closer to Japan and perhaps bring Japan closer to their orbit. And Japan would like to pull the Russians away from the Chinese. So there's a kind of um, uh, mirror image sort of strategy and uh, thinking on both sides. And you only can go so far with that. So I think you know, there have always been limitations. Some of them are the result of uh, Japanese and Russian domestic politics, and some of them have to do with the sort of strategic situation which Russia and China find themselves in. And so that was always going to be limited. Friends of mine who work on this, in, you know, both in, in Japan, say that there's real opportunity, but it's a lost opportunity. Um, and we'll never know, frankly, not for a long time. With regard to Korea, um, this is frankly, from my point of view, a tragic story, because we have a real human tragedy in terms of the surviving comfort women, the women who were pushed into sexual slavery uh, during the Japanese uh, imperial period. Um, and uh, they are disappearing. Um, and there was you know, a real sad story. And there's also the, the fact that when they disappear, the opportunity for Japan to make a really meaningful gesture vis-a-vis -vis these people vis-a-vis -vis the surviving comfort women also disappears with them. The issue won't go away, by the way. The problem here again, and so the, here Abe in some ways I think uh, exacerbates, does not help the problem. I mean, I, if I were a professor looking at Abe's foreign policy, not that I'm in any position to do so, I mean, I'd say an A minus or an A, A minus. I mean, he really accomplished a lot. I mean, more than what you would normally expect him to be able to achieve. But the Korean uh, situation... Korean the Korean Korean Korean. Korean. <laughs> yeah, right, well. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I think uh, here his instincts served him poorly because um, this is an issue requires patience and requires endless dialogue. Um, the United States has history problems too, as we are experiencing again this summer uh, with uh, Confederate monuments and uh, the history of of uh, race relations in this country. So, you know, we, we have to be very cautious, but we, re we recognize just how difficult, if we look at our own experience, these issues are and how much patience and dialogue this is going to be require. And the instinct which Abe has had and which other Japanese foreign policy leaders have had all the way back to 1965 when Japan and South Korea normalized relations um, after the colonial period, um, has always been, okay, we'll pay the Koreans off and we'll have some kind of final solution, dangerous term, but we'll have some kind of you know, per, you know, permanent solution to this issue. And that was very much <coughs> or on Abe in mind already when he came to the agreement back in, Sheila remind me, was it 2015 during the Obama administration? We had another big move forward. We apparently, you know, we had Abe and then the Korean president um, park meeting and shaking hands with Obama standing in the background looking on. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and then the obvious expectation this problem would disappear. These problems do not disappear. They require constant maintenance. 
Um, now, the Koreans didn't help things either. And the new Korean president, um, Lee myung bak uh, went, uh, succumbed to the temptation to right, appeal to uh, anti-Japanese nationalist sentiments in Korea by using this issue and expanding it in a very dangerous way by bringing in not only the comfort women, but bringing in the issue of forced laborers who had also existed. And so the whole relationship has been exploded. And we're right now in the worst moment in Japanese-Korean relations. I don't think it's been as bad, certainly not in my lifetime, not any time I can recall, and uh, it could get worse. And this is very unfortunate because Korea remains, in, after Japan, our most important partner in East Asia. Korea really is on the front line of a number of difficult issues. North Korea is becoming worse of a problem. And this is the moment when, purely for pragmatic, if not moral reasons, Japan and Korea should be working more closely with the United States to deal with those problems. And here, I'm afraid the history issue and Abe's inability, I don't blame him entirely, as there are a num number of things which fed into this, um, has, have failed. Sheila? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, you know, I, I agree with Tom. I think this is an area where um, the Abe cabinet um, struggled, to be quite honest. And, you know, the, 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 the year that Thomas was speaking about 2015, as we may or may not know, is the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. So here was Abe Shinzo as prime minister, who many people see as a revisionist nationalist, and he embraces that label himself at the time. He was due to make a statement in August, an Abe statement about the war. And of course, um, many people worried about what kind of statement he would be making. And um, to his credit, in the domestic political side of things, he actually put together an advisory panel, which included some of the academics on the more right nationalist vein, some outspoken, right, um, nationalists. Um, and he also put together, you know, uh, Yomiuri editorial uh, reporters, he put together a, a fairly right to right centrist group, right, um, that, that basically discussed, you know, you don't want to be creating a reality for Japan that has, you know, antipathy across the region, including in Washington, by the way, on this history issue, on this historical legacy issue. So it was an interesting time to be watching um, the kind of ideational motivations of Abe Shinzo as an individual. Right. And the pragmatic kind of realist geopolitical impulses that he had as as leader of Japan. So he set up the domestic political piece to have this advisory group, including people who are diplomatic historians like Kitaoka Shinichi, who is centrist conservative, um, and in a way to advise him. Uh, on what kind of statement needs to be made and what the diplomatic consequences of that could be. So it was an interesting time to watch Abe himself kind of wrestle with who he was and what he thought as an individual versus what the country may need of him as prime minister. Um, the other thing, the piece, and then again, just to put a little data point at the end of 2015, right? I was sitting here in Washington, December 28th, we were on holiday, it was beginning Christmas and New Year, all of us were relaxed, right? And I get phone calls from Japanese newspapers. Do you know there's about to be a comfort woman dis uh, agreement? And I said, no, that's not gonna happen. Because as you know, the, the, the Park Geun-hye was very outspoken on her expectations of Japan and very um, incongruent, let's say, with the way in which we all figured that Mr. Abe would respond to that. But within a couple of days before year's end, they managed to come together to reach an agreement and accord on the comfort women. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of it here or, or make a judgment about whether it was sufficient or insufficient, right? But I think this was a very big uh, step by both political leaders, honestly, to try to get a little bit closer to let's try to work this problem in a way that will satisfy the women themselves, but also the political demands in our both of our countries. Um, I think what you've got is a whole constellation of issues Tom's already talked about since then, since the end of 2015, which is this very important anniversary year. Um, I, I don't think Japan had, um, I, I think Japan could have done better, absolutely. I think Korea could have done better, absolutely. I think both countries now have very complex domestic politics on these issues. 
both are kind of rigid and enough already on both sides, right? Um, and you've got a progressive left leader in Moon Jae-in in Seoul, and you've got, you know, Abe Shinzo, and now succeeding him, Suga, who is not necessarily an ideologue, but certainly a, a representative of the conservative party that rules Japan, right? So I don't see, I don't see the historical legacy issues um, being resolved diplomatically anytime soon. And a complicating factor, of course, is that the Supreme Court in South Korea has now become a central player uh, in this story between the two countries. And um, that it's just compounding a, an already difficult problem. And, you know, we may all, Tom has written a book on this. And so I shouldn't be saying this, this is Tom's expertise, but, okay. you know, I, I have limits. I think we should be limited in our expectations of what can be negotiated when you come to questions of generational change and historical memory on war and the kind of systems of coercion that we see, um, both in the comfort women specifically for the sexual slavery of, of, of women, um, or whether you see other kinds of issues, the POWs, the forced labor. I think it's very hard to tie that up in a neat bow and put it in a box like a 65 agreement and expect it to stay there over time. So that's a much more bigger philosophical question. Um, but I think we're seeing domestic politics on both sides really undermine any diplomatic, even if you had really cooperative intent, I think it would be hard for either government to try to make this happen. I, I think we, if I have to, just two seconds, Jack, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I think it's also important to include both Koreas uh, when we're thinking about Japan's foreign policy, because another way, place where Abe Shinzo's cabinet uh, really wanted to change, right, the diplomatic opportunity for Japan was in reaching out to Kim Jong-un to have a direct dialogue between Tokyo and, and Pyongyang. And as we all know, in watching the Singapore meeting with Trump and Kim Jong-un and then the Hanoi meeting, there was an awful lot of major power interactions going on there in a very intense way over a year or two. Um, but Japan was always on the outside. And Kim Jong-un never gave Abe uh, the, the let's go, let's meet, let's have a conversation. Um, and so there were moments earlier before Trump came to power where Kim Jong-un did reach out to Abe and to Tokyo. Um, but I think if you're thinking about Japan's long-term strategic uh, interests, it's both Koreas that we should be, we should be talking about, not just Seoul. Um, because of course it's the acquisition of nuclear capability and the means to deliver it by the North that will fundamentally change and drive I think Japanese thinking about the peninsula overall. And I think that's what you've seen. We saw it in 2017 with all the missile launches, you see it today. Uh, anybody who is ruling Japan, who is prime minister will have to take into account the North as it thinks about the South. And so I think whether that's realist pressure to change what is a very difficult issue of war memory or whether it's the inverse, whether war memory gets in the way of Japan's strategic interests. I can't say how it's gonna turn out, but it's a very tough knot for any Japanese leader to try to, to manage. Well, I wanna uh, work in some of our questions uh, from the audience here. We've sort of been doing a, a map tour. It's a good thing that uh, my colleague, uh, Eli put up the uh, map. Uh, so we have questions about India and mm -hmm. Abe, policies toward India generally, but also specifically the role of Japan in the so-called Quad, the Australia, US, Japan, India, uh, very loose security uh, alignment, which certainly the Chinese have their eye on. Uh, they tend to discount it publicly, but, but do see it as uh, probably the, the biggest security innovation in the region that, that's something of a problem for them. Um, I guess start with Tom on this. Since the early Bush administration, <laughs> that is the second Bush administration, GW, um, the US and Japan have been interested, and Abe certainly in his first um, time, shot at prime minister also followed this, in trying to get India involved more in uh, stabilizing the East Asian situation. India is a tough, my wife is from India, I go to India with some regularity. India is a tough nut to crack on that score. Um, India has its own set of preoccupations, um, it has its own set of concerns, and India is also very reluctant to be drawn into an alliance-type system. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with some senior U.S. naval officers, and they were, you know, they said, we've come so far, and then we come to a little thing, like landing an American plane and just doing a photo op on the Andaman Islands, which is in the Indian Ocean, and we are running into all kinds of roadblocks. 
Um, that's continued to be true under Modi, um, even under Modi. And Modi, again, is an interesting Abe-like figure coming out of a nationalist conservative background in his own country. Um, on the future of that relationship, if you want to have deeper Japanese, US, Australian quad type relations with India, um, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is China is helping overcome those that, that kind of reluctance. And the, you know, the most recent fight over the territory, Arunachal Pradesh, all of this, I mean, China is, to my mind, really unnecessarily provoking India and pushing them, it, India into our arms. So, you know, I think that there are reasons to think that this has some legs. The bad news is, and this has been always the problem, going even further back. I mean, if you go back to the 1950s, the US also had ideas about creating a East Asian NATO type NATO. Uh, the Manila Pact, CETO, the idea of creating my favorite non-existent alliance, Northeast Asian Treaty Organization. I'd love to be able to talk about NATO. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it always floundered and it floundered on a fundamental reality that this is a very diverse region, diverse in terms of cultures, languages, political systems, and geographical position being that big. Europe is comparatively compact and Europe is big, but East Asia and India, they're just very large. And as a result, they find themselves in very different geostrategic situations and it's always gonna be difficult to coordinate. Um, and so we have to be, I think, guarded in terms of our expectations of the, how far we can get. I think right now there are a lot of opportunities and useful things uh, that we can do. We are doing things. The Indian Navy is competent, capable, and working together to, uh, for example, track Chinese submarines as they transition from the South China Seas into the Indian Ocean, keeping an eye on what China is doing in Djibouti, its first overseas base. Those kinds of things, practical kinds of things we can do, we can continue to do, and I expect more of it. Unfortunately, the Indians also militarily bought in heavily into Soviet type equipment. So they're trying to switch into a more Western style alliance. It's got a big barrier to entry for them. But um, I think uh, we've got lots of opportunities in the short medium run, but we need to keep track of this big strategic reality. It's always going to be tough, given both India's domestic politics and the geostrategic situation, uh, situation in Asia in general. Sheila, you want to weigh in on this? Uh... I, you know, I largely agree, I agree with Tom. I think it's, uh, I am not a big fan of the formalized quad. You know, I mean, we, we throw out that word as if we know what it means, but the reality is even when it comes to the free and open Indo-Pacific, the four countries we're referencing with the word quad, United States, Japan, Australia, and India have very different emphases in their approach to, to the free and open Indo-Pacific. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think we should resist trying to focus it in on a military quad that's going to contain China. And so I, I, I resist that word, not because I resist the cooperation between those four powers, but because I think flexible, flexible meeting of the minds kind of cooperation are more likely to come organically than they are if we try to force it into a you know, set of expectations that these four powers. The other thing to remember about the quad, of course, is that we want South Korea we want the Southeast Asian states, right, to be supportive of a free and open Indo-Pacific vision. We don't want them to feel like there is this subset of major powers in the region that are dictating what happens vis-a-vis -vis China. And so I think there's also some downsides, maybe a little bit of an Achilles heel to pushing quad too much. So informal, flexible, and inclusive. I think those are the ways we want to go because that's always been the way in which a a Asia Pacific cooperation has been. <coughs> So there's a, I think there's a preference for that style, but I think it also is more effective. Um, one thing I will say is that there's an awful lot of interesting trilateralization, trilateralism going on, right? And um, Tom, it, it, Tom was, was inferring some of this as well. So US, Japan, India, Malabar exercises, very important. They take place in the Indian Ocean. They've recently moved over to more closely to the Pacific Ocean. There's flexibility in that concept, right? Um, Australia, Japan, United States, much more expansive security cooperation. And now the bilateral Australia-Japan security relationship is, is probably the deepest in, in the region. Um, I, so I think you've got a lot of things where you've got opportunity, 
you don't always have to all have all four, four players at the same scene, especially militarily at the same time. And then the last piece is what we, you, you and Tom started it when you were talking, which is this Modi piece. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on Indian politics and won't pretend to be, but we have a particular moment of Indian ambition and Indian foreign policy aspirations under Prime Minister Modi, fed in some ways by the, the nationalism at home for a stronger Indian identity, right, on the, sta on, on the global stage. Um, that doesn't mean that that, that continuity is going to stay. I think when you look at Japan, though, I think you've got a long-term strategic place for Japan, um, where the, the the free and open Indo-Pacific is just it, it is so reflective of Japanese long-term interest that even in the absence of Abe, you're still going to see much of the kind of what's under the hood <laughs> of that vision. You're going to see those pieces continue to be part of whatever um, successive prime minister is going to articulate for it, Japan's role in the region. I think India is a little bit less clear. I think Australia right now is pivoting a little bit towards the, the independent military power part, which is interesting to watch. Not sure what the longevity, what the, le look, the legs look like on that Australian uh, foreign policy, but I think you, you've got different investments over, over the longer term in terms of embrace of this vision. So I think we ought to be careful about the quad. I don't think there's any reason to push a quad-like grouping, except for where it makes sense and where people are willing to come to the table. And as Tom pointed out earlier, China's behavior makes it increasingly easy for leaders in all of the four countries of the quad to come to the table because we're worried. We're worried about what China is going to do and what China is up to. And again, I'm not trying to make China the bad guy here, but I, it's increasingly looking like Chinese ambitions are not going to be uh, in our interest over the long haul. And I think that that brings the four countries together quite naturally. Yeah, I'm afraid I'd have to agree with that as well. Um, so I want to save some time at the back end here for, uh, for looking forward, but uh, a couple of, of uh, questions about the link between domestic politics and foreign policy in Japan, which we've talked about a little bit. And so we've got a, a few of them in the, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the question about Fukushima. Uh, the nuclear disaster and, and what that means for Abe's uh, legacy and, and, and Japan's stature uh, in the region. Uh, a second one is the failure to get the constitutional amendment, the amendment to Article 9 through, even though he did get reinterpretation and the security law package that, that uh, uh, Tom alluded to earlier. Um, and thirdly, Abenomics, uh, you know, it, 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 what that has, has meant for uh, Japan's um, economic vibrancy and, 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 and what flows from that. So uh, you, don't, you don't both have to enter all of those. Indeed, it's probably better if we get a little selective. We're gonna hit four o'clock pretty soon. Uh, I'll throw it out. To, I guess we'll stick with Sheila and then go to Tom. All right, let me be very quick. I, 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 will, I, will, I, will let, I will not answer the Fukushima question because I'm not sure how to answer that question. But um, I, the constitutional revision one is something we think about a lot as Japan specialists. And so let me just share my thoughts. <coughs> I think, yeah, the, the Article 9 reinterpretation, um, uh, the Abe cabinet's reinterpretation in 2014, and then the security laws that were passed in the Diet in 2015 was probably one of his biggest contributions to Japanese security policy reform, really opens the door not only to cooperation with the United States military, but to national militaries across the region. Very important to remember, because Americans sometimes think it's just about us. It's not just about us. Um, but I think what's interesting here, and for those of you who are not Japan politics uh, experts, uh, it's useful to remember that the LDP was formed in 1955 with constitutional revision as part of its platform. So you are always going to see a rhetorical referencing to the ambition of constitutional revision. People within the LDP have varying degrees of commitment to this. Um, they may focus on different aspects of what needs to be amended. And of course they won't, many of them, always go to Article 9, right? Which is the most sensitive third rail kind of set of issues, right? But I think Abe in some ways, we did a project to CFR, I hate to advertise, but it's, <laughs> we have an info guide that we hope educators and others will look at on CFR.org that looks at Japan's constitutional debate. And part of what we did there was look at long-term Japanese public opinion on this question of revision. And one thing that stands out is that during the Abe tenure, um, 
both because he reinterpreted Article 9 to allow collective security, right, collective self-defense, right? Um, and you see people thinking, okay, that's enough on the military side. And you see a little bit more hesitancy during his time as prime minister on this question of revision than you did under other leaders, which is interesting to me. But it is quite in sync with what we saw in 2015 when the Diet was debating the new security laws, which is no to Abe's war bills, right? Very Abe focused. So the association of Abe's ideational kind of commitments, his personal views, and taking Japan too far from where the public may be comfortable, right? Um, that's an important factor to keep in mind. It may very well be that another Japanese prime minister will be more successful at revision. Uh, because they won't be seen as such an advocate of a more hawkish view on what Japan ought to do. Speculation on my part, but it's interesting in the public opinion poll, and you see that actually uh, during the Abe tenure, that public support for revision, even among the conservatives, goes down rather than goes up. So that's one piece on that. On the Abenomics, let me say just two or three sentences. Um, Abenomics depends on a sturdy and cooperative global economy. No doubt about it. So two pieces of the puzzle, changing uh, monetary policy towards the quantitative easing, the strategies that many of the other advanced industrial democracies have, been in, have adopted in the wake of Lehman, particularly. Um, that was a big shift for the Bank of Japan. Kuroda is still there. He will continue to be there. People like him, I suspect, will continue to occupy the position of leading Japan's monetary policy. So I think that's a, that's a shift in monetary policy that goes beyond just Japanese experience, but embraces what, what, what has been changing in monetary policy among the G7 for, a long, for some time. Fiscal stimulus, always part of Japanese public policy, public economic policy, right? So relying on stimulus. The problem for Japan is its debt. Uh, its government debt, as many of you know, is 230 something percent uh, of its GDP, right? So government debt is high. It's not necessarily dependent on foreign sources of debt, but in the current global economy, this is a tenuous position for Japan to be in, right? So I think you've got this tug and pull between public debt and this fiscal stimulus piece as an instrument of Japanese economic policy. The longer term challenge for Abe and for anybody who comes later is the structural reforms. That piece of Abenomics I think is actually fundamental to Japan's success going forward. Demographics are not in Japanese favor, so whether you're reforming agriculture, whether you're bringing women into the workplace, whether you're changing immigration policy, there is a host of structural issues that Japan will have to tackle more forcefully. They're very politically difficult because they mean changing the political balance of support for the, for the LDP over, overall. So yeah, this is a space to watch. I think the, the long game is the structural reforms. I think it takes an awful lot of political weight to make that happen. Abe had the opportunity. I don't know that Suga will. I wanted to just, I mean, quickly follow up. It's interesting that Suga is making administrative reform and deregulation the, you know, the front piece. So and I know that some of the people, and your audience is interested in what now. Well, what now is that Suga, I think appropriately, is focusing on what used to be called the third arrow, the structural reform that Japan needs. Uh, it's interesting to note that he, um, it's not, by the way, and he has a reputation for being a domestic politics guy, and he is, but it's not that he's ignorant. I mean, if you, nobody can be. He's the longest serving chief cabinet secretary in Japan's history. So he's, he's had eight years of experience. That means he's been at all of the briefings. And those, many of the issues that he's been dealing with, for example, he dealt with the U.S. bases. He dealt with the abductee issue. He also was the point man on, on pushing immigration, opening up a little bit the doors to immigration. So he's very sensitive to those kinds of things. I think that's his main focus. It's also very interesting if you take a look at the personnel. The new chief cabinet secretary is a former Ministry of, Foreign, of uh, Finance guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he moved the very capable and very outspoken um, as last foreign min a defense minister and before that foreign minister, uh, Kono, to the position of being the minister for a reform. So you can just take a look, the Japanese term for this fuseki, how you're placing your stones on a board right, of Go. He's getting ready to focus on this. Um, in terms of the foreign policy, one thing he's going to benefit, by the way, which I do want to mention, even though Abe never was able to push through administrative reform, precisely for the paradox that Sheila just said, to do an administration, constitutional reform, to do constitutional reform, you need a strongly motivated, powerful prime minister. 
to push it through, you have to get somebody who's committed to, to actually push it through. You need to be somebody who doesn't create the kind of discomfort. Abe is not a militarist. He's not an authoritarian, right? Even though he's often criticized for that. He is a nationalist, yeah? but his overall constellation, his background, his views, also his personal background, his grandfather who was his political mentor was Kishi Noboske, former prime minister and minister of munitions in the Togo government during the Second World War. And then before that, head of the Manchukuo, um, uh, the Manchuria Railroad, those are all things that make people nervous. So you know, he can't push that through. But what he did push through, and we shouldn't neglect this, is he created a, he strengthened the office of the prime minister, and he also created the National Security Council, which brought in, and it's an effective National Security Council, and it brings in both the, um, the foreign ministry and the defense ministry, coordinating Japanese foreign policy in a way that was not true before. And that's reflective, that Suga is going to benefit from that. And any Japanese prime minister in the future is going to be able to draw on a much more coordinated approach to foreign policy than has been true in the past. So I think there are going to be lots of issues that Suga, whether Suga wants to deal with it or not. I don't usually quote Lenin. Lenin you know, famously said, you may not be interested <laughs> in politics, but politics is interested in you. Japan and the Japanese people may not be interested in international relations, but international relations is sure as heck going to be interested in Japan because we're moving into a much more tricky, antsy kind of situation in East Asia. And Japan, as I pointed out earlier, is on the front line of a lot of the problems, including the South China Seas, including the East China Seas, the Korean Peninsula, you know, they're involved. And I think we're going to see a more effective Japan in dealing with these things and under Suga. And I, th I have a positive, I mean, Suga is capable. He's, a, um, uh, he's got a reputation for being able to push things through. So um, uh, lots of things to watch moving forward. Sheila and I are, are maybe invited to more of these kinds of talks. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I hate to have to end this, uh, but that's what I want to end it on. I thank you. Uh, Thomas Berger for uh, smuggling into your answer the last question I was going to ask, which is where did things of things like that they had under Suga? Uh, as our audience, I sure can appreciate that you know why I asked these two to join us today. The, the range and depth of their, their knowledge and engagement on these are, are truly impressive. And a couple of questions I didn't get to, but I think we'll have a good occasion to then try to hook you back in, which is let's look at things a few months down the road. Once we see what Suga is up to as prime minister and we see how the U.S election turns out, which is going to create some interesting issues uh, for Japan, as well as it does here at home. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you, audience, for, uh, for being with us today and for your excellent questions in the Q&A uh, box. And I will now throw it back to Raleigh to uh, sing us out. Okay. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Sheila and Tom. That was fantastic. And the one thing I can say for sure is we have to have you back because you have <laughs> a lot of unanswered questions. So we're, we're over time, but I can't resist an opportunity to talk to our audience while we've got you about our coming attractions because we have some really interesting discussions coming up. It's not on our calendar yet, but Monday we're going to have a discussion <laughs> on uh, Monday morning on Nagorno-Karabakh, which is very much in the news and a developing story. Um, on Tuesday, October 13th, we have uh, Ron Granieri, our executive director of the Center for the Study of America and the West, who will be talking with our senior fellow, Jeremy Black, whom many of you know, about his new book, Military Strategy, A Global History. Then on Thursday, the 15th, we have the next in our series of um, events related to our publication of our book, Russia's Way of War in Syria. We're going to be talking talking about the Russian Navy in this installment. And then Friday, October 16th, we're featuring a discussion between our newest FBRI trustee, General H.R. McMaster, and our Robert Strauss Hupe Chair in Geopolitics, Robert Kaplan. They're gonna be discussing General McMaster's new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. And then I can't resist putting in a plug for an event we're having with some of my old colleagues from the CIA. On Friday, October 13th, uh, we're having a panel discussion on intelligence challenges in an election year. Uh, this features a panel of very senior top CIA officials, including acting director, former acting director and deputy director of the CIA, John McLaughlin, talking about what it's like in the real world to brief presidential can candidates on intelligence topics. Um, I saw this event 
done in for a Washington audience. And I said, we need to bring this here. So stay tuned. Thank you again for your support. And I look forward to seeing you at future events. And Tom, Sheila, Jacques, fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.